Yeah, it looks like uh, we're going to do the exam on Tuesday, the 21st, Philip. Um, that's the plan, at least. So we'll go with the exam on Thursday and, uh, yeah, go from there. So cool. Uh, let's see if any questions, no other questions, we'll get started. Uh, last time we talked about power series solutions of differential equations around ordinary points, and then uh, things went haywire. We had uh, some problems with our stream, so got cut off, and then I asked you to watch uh, like a slew of videos that I put out already, and hopefully you watch those already. And today we're going to do just a little bit more with uh, singular points, solutions about singular points. And then uh, we're going to look at an example today, and then we'll go into Bessel and Legendre equations. So um, this is Frobenius's theorem. It tells us how to find a solution, a series solution, around a regular singular point. So Frobenius's theorem says... If x equals x0 is a regular singular point of the differential equation, a2 of x y double prime plus a1 of x y prime plus a0 of x e y equals 0, then there exists at least one solution of the form y equals a summation from 0 to infinity cn x minus x0 to the n plus r, where the number r is a constant to be determined. Furthermore, the series will converge on at least some finite interval. So there is some interval of convergence. So some non-zero finite interval of convergence. Possibly infinite, but most likely it's finite because we have singular points. So um, the, uh, the thing to take away here is only for regular singular points. So some notes that we have are that this is number one only for regular singular points. Actually, if it's irregular, there may not even be a solution at all. So if we're trying to find a solution around an irregular singular point, it may not even exist. So for a regular singular point, we can guarantee at least one solution of this form. However, the second note is to note that if R whatever it turns out to be later, if R is a uh, non, is not a non-negative integer, this will not be a power series. It's a different kind of series, a series where the x's have fractional exponents or even uh, like 1 over x, possibly. So it, it could be um, a weird series, not necessarily a power series. A power series is strictly like polynomials, like x, x squared, x cubed, x to the 4, etc. This thing might have like x to the 3 halves, x to the 5 halves, x to the 7 halves. So just keep that in mind. It's not really a power series all the time, but it is a series solution nonetheless. So what we're going to do today is look at an example of this solution type using this method of Frobenius, and then um, we'll look at special cases of method of Frobenius after we do this example, and then we'll move on to Bessel and Legendre equations. So Let's look at the example that we have here. So the example that we have here uh, says find two linearly independent series solutions about the regular singular point x equals 0 of the differential equation 2xy double prime minus y prime plus 2y equals 0. So that's going to be our example. So solution. We start off with y equals the summation of n equals 0 to infinity. I change my pen size a little bit. So y equals summation n goes from 0 to infinity, cn x to the n plus r. 
So that is our starting point, and here this regular singular point is x equals 0. So we don't have to do x minus anything, it's just x minus 0, which is x. Now we have to take the uh, first derivative, y prime, and that's going to be the summation, n equals 0 to infinity, cn times n plus r, x to the n plus r minus 1. And now, unlike when we had ordinary singular points, our summation starts out at 0 right here. So we, we don't change the starting index when it's a singular point because n equals 0, well, this n plus r may or may not still be 0 because r may or may not be 0. So we leave it at n equals 0 for the first derivative, and then for the second derivative, y double prime, we leave it at 0 again. So starting point, n equals 0 to infinity, cn, n plus r, pull the exponent down so you get n plus r minus 1, x to the n plus r minus 2. So those are our terms that we're going to substitute into the differential equation. So now now substitute these three into the differential equation. So that's going to give us 2x times the summation from 0 to infinity, cn n plus r, n plus r minus 1, x to the n plus r minus 2, minus summation, n equals 0 to infinity, cn n plus r, x to the n plus r minus 1, plus 2 times summation from 0 to infinity, cn x to the n plus r equals 0. And you might say, what is this r value? Well, we're not going to find that until um, we start to break up our series and combine it into a single series. So um, we're going to wait. This r value is going to be always determined through the solution process. So don't try to jump ahead too quickly and try to figure out what r is. There is like an explicit equation, but uh, I'm not going to go through it. You can always get it through the solution process itself. So uh, we've got everything set up now. Um, let's pull these terms in. So pull the 2 inside right here and then pull this x in to the exponent up here. Same thing here, pull this 2 inside right here. So that's going to turn everything into the summation, n equals 0 to infinity, C, uh, 2 times cn, n plus r times n plus r minus 1, x to the n plus r Minus 2 plus 1 would be minus 1, because I'm combining those x terms. Minus the summation, n equals 0 to infinity, cn n plus r, x to the n plus r minus 1. Plus summation, n equals 0 to infinity, 2 times cn, x to the n plus r equals 0. All right, so far so good. Now our goal at this point is to combine everything into a single series. So our goal at this point is to combine everything into a single series. So our goal is combine into a single series. To do this, we need exponent of x to be the same. And we need start.
starting index of the series to be the same. All right, so that's our goal. We have to get the starting index to be the same. We have to get the exponent to be the same. So the first thing I'm going to do is I always like to make the exponent the same and then worry about the starting index. Okay, so I'm going to worry about the exponents. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn all the exponents into k plus r. So I'm going to use x to the k plus r. I always like to turn them into x to the k plus r. So that means in the first series right here, I'm going to use um, k equals n minus 1. So this first series, I'm going to use k equals n minus 1. The second series, I'm going to do the same thing, k equals n minus 1. And the last series, I'm going to use k equals n. And that will turn the exponent into k plus r or sorry, yeah, k plus r in each of the series. Now if we do that, if n equals 0, k is actually equal to negative 1. So if n equals 0, that tells us k is going to be negative 1. Not going to be a big problem, um, but it does feel a little bit weird. It's kind of like a u sub for a series. And if n goes to infinity, k is also going to go to infinity. And then same thing here. k equals negative 1. And k equals infinity. If n equals 0. And if n goes to infinity. So that is our setup. And then k equals 0 here. And then k goes to infinity here if n equals 0 and n equals infinity or goes to infinity. So we're going to take all of that and change how our series look. We're going to change the variable from k or sorry from n to k. So let's do that. All right, so that's going to tell us we have a summation from k equals negative 1 to infinity. Well, if, let's look back, if k is equal to n minus 1, then n is equal to k plus 1. So everywhere we see an n, we're going to substitute a k plus 1. So that'll be 2 ck plus 1, k plus 1 plus r. So that'll be 2 ck plus 1, k plus 1 plus r. The next one was k plus 1, or that the next one was n plus r minus 1. This is going to be k plus r. x to the k plus r. Minus the summation, k equals negative 1 to infinity. Of c k plus 1. And then k plus 1 plus r. x to the k plus r plus the summation k equals 0 to infinity of ck x to the k plus r equals 0. So again, we just basically, we've done like a u substitution, but we call it a, a change of index for the series. <clears throat> now, we've got all the exponents on x to be the same but our starting indices for our series are not the same. So what we're going to do now is pull out the k equals negative 1 terms from the first two series. So break out k equals negative 1 terms from the first two series. To get starting indices to be the same. To be k equals 0. All 
So if we do that, basically plug in k equals negative 1, I get 2c0 times r times k or r minus 1 x to the r minus 1. So that's k equals 0 from the first series plus the summation k equals, or sorry, that's k equals negative 1. So this is now left with the summation k equals 0 to infinity 2ck plus 1 times k plus 1 plus r times k plus r x to the k plus r. So that's the first series. Pulled out the k equals negative 1 term right here. So k equals negative 1. Basically this whole thing right here. And then the rest, k equals 0 to infinity, I leave in a series. Now the second series, I'm going to do minus c0 times r x to the r minus 1 minus the summation k equals 0 to infinity ck plus 1 k plus 1 plus r x to the k plus r and then the last one we don't have to do anything so just leave it summation k goes from 0 to infinity ck x to the k plus r equals 0 This was k equals negative 1 for the second series. And then the series k equals 0 to infinity is the rest of the series. All right, so now I'm going to pull those two k equals negative 1 terms to the front and factor out um, whatever I can. So then it's going to leave out front, um, let's see, 2r times r minus 1 minus r times c0 x to the r minus 1. Make sure I factored that out right. c0 and x to the r minus 1 can come out of those two terms. Leaves 2r r minus 1 minus r plus, and now everything else can be combined into a single series from k equals 0 to infinity. Of Two, let's see, call it 2ck plus 1 times k plus r plus 1 times k plus r minus ck plus 1 times k plus 1 plus r plus ck times x to the k plus r equals 0. So my goodness, quite, uh, quite the problem. These series solutions are always quite involved. So what we're going to do now is take this coefficient of c0 and simplify it. So this coefficient becomes 2r squared minus 2r minus r. And that coefficient, whatever is attached to the lowest power of x, <clears throat> is going to be where we get this r value. So we set this thing equal to 0. So we always set the r coefficient of c0 equal to 0. to get our r values. So to get the r values. So that's how we get those values of r. We always take them when they're attached to c0 and set whatever's left equal to 0. So we could actually 
I should have actually factored out an r. So r times 2r minus 3 equals 0. So that tells me r equals 0 or r equals 3 halves. Okay. So this is what we call our recurrence relation. Oh, sorry, this is what we call our initial roots. So we call these two right here the initial roots. Initial roots. So, good stuff. Now, we also take this. Did I drop a two? I feel like I dropped a two on the last series. Yeah, I did. Should be a two here. So let me fix that. Two goes here. Two goes here. Two goes here. Sorry about that. That is definitely a mistake, but we caught it just in time because we're about to do the recurrence relation. So let me fill that two in. All right, now. What do we do now? We take the coefficient of x to the k plus r and set it equal to zero, basically by linear independence. So last thing to do is say by linear independence, we set coefficients of x to the k plus r equal to zero. So we're going to take this whole big thing in brackets and set it equal to zero. And we plug in a specific value of r. So for r equals zero, we'll have one expression, and for r equals three halves, we'll have a different expression. So let's look to see what that's going to be um, if we plug in specific values of r. So uh, let me simplify it a little bit and then plug in values. So, so let me just write it over here, 2ck plus 1 times k plus 1 plus r times k plus r minus ck plus 1 times k plus 1 plus r minus, or plus 2ck. Okay, and that thing is going to be equal to 0. Now let's look at, uh, let's simplify this a little bit. So what can we do? From the first two terms, we can actually factor out a ck plus one and a k plus one plus r. So we factor out a ck plus one and a k plus one plus r. Inside, that would leave two times k plus r minus one plus 2ck equals 0. So from the first two terms, I'm just factoring out a ck plus 1 and a k plus 1 plus r. Now simplify a little bit, get ck plus 1 times k plus 1 plus r times 2k plus 2r minus 1 plus 2ck equals 0. <clears throat> and we're going to solve, always solve, always solve for the larger coefficient, larger index coefficient. In terms of smaller index. So ck plus 1 equal to negative 2ck over k plus 1 plus r times 2k plus 2r minus 1.
and that is true for k greater or equal to 0. So for k starting at 0, I would have c1 in terms of c0. And now, based on the r values, we have two different reference relations. So let's look at, over here on the left, k r equals 0. And over here on the right, we'll look at r equals 3 halves. So we have two different recurrences depending on the r values, the initial roots. So on the left, we have ck plus 1 equals negative 2 ck over k plus 1 times 2k minus 1. Because I'm just plugging in r equals 0. So that's called your reference relation for the smaller initial root. So this is our reference relation for the smaller initial root. So reference for the smaller initial root. And plug in r equals 3 halves, we get ck plus 1 equals negative 2 ck over c k plus 1 plus 3 halves times 2k plus 3 minus 1. And we can simplify that to be negative 2 ck over k plus 5 halves times 2k plus 2. All right, so far we've got two recurrence relations, one for the larger initial root, so that's over here on the right, k greater or equal to 0. So the one on the right is for the larger initial root, and the one on the left is for the smaller initial root. Now what we're going to do is start to look at the coefficients of C1 in terms of C0, and then C2 in terms of C1, which then we'll put it in terms of C0. So let's start to evaluate all of these recurrences. So for r equals 0, for r equals 0, and then over here we'll do r equals 3 halves. Let's look at the recurrence. C1 will be negative 2 C0 over 1 times 2, whoops, if I'm plugging in k equals 0, it would be 0 minus 1, which just becomes 2 C0. So C1 in terms of C0 for the first initial root is just 2 C0. And then C2 be equal to negative 2 C1 over 2 times 1, which will be negative C1. But we know C1 in terms of C0, so that's negative 2 C0. So I've got C2 in terms of C0. Let's do C3. C3 is equal to um, negative 2 C2 over 3 times 2, which will be equal to let's see, the 2 would cancel, and now we got C2 in terms of C0, so that will be 4. C0 over 9. Hold up. Negative 
negative c2 over 3, which will be 2c0 over 3. Uh, I think I, this should be a 3 here. That's what I was screwing up. There we go. This parentheses should be a 3, not a 2. There we go. Now it's going to be 4c0 over 9. And c4, my favorite, it's going to be, let's see, negative 2c3 over 4 times 5, 4 times 5, which equals, let's see, negative 2 over 20 times 4 over 9, c0, which is negative 8, well, let's see what we can cancel. Um, 4 here cancels, we get 5, so negative 2 over 45. C zero. So that is starting to get like an explicit representation of our series for the smaller initial root. So that's going to be a series for our smaller initial root. And then for the larger initial root, C1 will be equal to negative 2C0 over Five halves times two. And that reduces to uh, negative two fifths C zero. C two is going to equal negative two C one over let's see seven halves times four. which equals negative 2 over 14 times negative 2 over 5 c0 and that's really 2 over 35 c0 so 2 over 35 c0 c3 can be negative 2 c2 over 9 halves times 6, which is negative 4 over 945 c0. And I'll just give you c4. Turns out to be 2 c0 over 10,395, etc. So the first set of solutions, recall, we had y was equal to some series from 0 to infinity, cn, x to the n plus r. Well, now our first solution is going to be with r equals 0. We get our first solution. And the second one, r equals 3 halves, we get our second solution. So let's look at the two solutions now, if we write them out kind of explicitly. y equals c0 plus 2c0 x to the 1 minus 2c0 x to the 2 plus 4 over 9, c0, x to the 3, minus 2 over 45, c0, x to the 4, plus dot, dot, dot. So that's like our first solution. And then y2, our second solution, is going to be c0, x to the 3 halves. Because if I plug in n equals 0 to the series, r is 3 halves. I just have x to the 3 halves. All right. Um, minus 2 fifths c0, x to the 5 halves, 
plus 2 over 35 c0 x to the 7 halves minus 4 over 945 c0 x to the 9 halves plus 2c0 over 10,395 x to the 11 halves. Now it's actually probably bad for me to use the same constant c0. So we should actually change that to be like c1 over here for the second solution because we're going to multiply by a constant anyway, c, c0 and c1. So the general solution, so the general solution is y equals c1 y1 plus c2 y2. So quite, uh, quite a process here, quite a process. That equation where we got r, that's called the initial equation, and the roots themselves are called the initial roots of the singularity. So definition, the equation for coefficient of c0 x to the r minus 1 times f of r where f of r equals 0. This equation right here is called the initial equation. The roots are called the initial roots. Now, most of the time on like an exam or whatever, we don't uh, we don't ask you to find the solution, like all these coefficients or whatever. We normally ask you just to find the recurrence relation for a certain root, like the larger initial root or the smaller initial root or something like that. So, however, uh, it's good to see the whole thing written out sometimes, just to just to be thorough at least once or twice. So what could happen? Three cases for the method of Frobenius. Three cases for the method of Frobenius. So what could happen is case one. If R1 and R2 are distinct, and let's just assume that R1 is greater than R2, and R1 minus R2 is not a positive integer, then there are two linearly independent solutions. And we saw there the form y1 equals summation 0 to infinity, cn, x to the n plus r1, and y2 be equal to the summation from 0 to infinity, cn, x to the n plus r2. Um, we should actually use a different coefficient. I'll use a coefficient bn here.
And that was actually our case that we just went through. Our example, we had two initial roots that were distinct, and the difference, 3 halves minus 0, was 3 halves. That's not a positive integer. Therefore, we found two solutions. However, that's not always the case. Um, case two. is if R1 and R2 are distinct, again, R1 larger than R2, and R1 minus R2 is a positive integer, then there exist two linearly independent solutions y1 equals summation 0 to infinity cn x to the n plus r1 and y2 actually is a reduction of order. It's going to be some constant times y1 natural log x plus some n equals 0 to infinity bn x to the n plus r2. So it's actually a reduction of order to get the second linearly independent solution in the case where you have two distinct uh, roots, initial roots, but you get a positive integer as the difference. <clears throat> and then case three, uh, it's a similar situation. So case three, if it's a repeated root, so if R1 equals R2, then Y1 equals the summation 0 to infinity, cn, x to the n plus r1, and y2 equals y1, natural log x, plus summation, n equals 1 to infinity, bn, x to the n plus r1. So it's similar, but not exactly the same as uh, case 2, because here the root is repeated. So it'd be the almost the same series on the right. So, questions? I know that is a lot of stuff. This last part, this last slide, the only thing that's really important is uh, knowing the initial roots and the initial equation. I'm not going to ask you to find a second linearly independent solution using reduction of order or anything like that. So, uh, don't worry about that too much. So, I'll pause for questions just for a minute, see if anything's, anyone's got any uh, questions. A uh, quick question for you guys. Did you have a chance to watch all the videos that I posted or I sent you links for? Guy had already posted those uh, quite a while back. However, they are they're very thorough in discussing singular points and uh, also that one about radius of convergence. If you watch the method of Frobenius one I posted, then that's that's fine too. But we covered that again today, so hopefully it was a little bit of a review. Did you guys have a chance to do that? Again, I did that because the stream kind of messed up pretty badly last time.
So I tried to revamp significantly today. Looks like it's going well. I like the new setup a little bit better than last time. I think that's working out. Just let me know. We'll take a, take a few a few minutes before we move on to Bessel. Okay, cool. Well, let's look at uh, special functions and special equations. Uh, these are also going to be series solutions, but they're very uh, uh, special equations in that they're of a very specific form. The first one is called the uh, Bessel equation, parametric Bessel equation. So the Bessel equation is the equation of the form x squared y double prime plus xy prime. You say, wait a minute, that's Cauchy Euler. Well, here's where it mixes it up a little bit. Plus lambda squared x squared minus v squared y equals zero. <clears throat> so Lambda and V are just real numbers, so Lambda and V are real numbers. So they're just two parameters. So um, how do we solve? Well, note X equals zero is a regular singular point so we can use the method of Frobenius I may or may not have called this guy Frobaby previously so we could use the method of Frobaby And man, wow. So what is that? That's like you do y equals a summation, 0 to infinity, cn, x to the n plus r. All the stuff. Oh my goodness. It's such a long process. A lot of work. I'm not going to go through it all, but you can imagine. I go through all this work. 
eventually we get initial roots eventually we get r is equal to plus or minus v so there's a lot of work that goes on and oh my goodness all right so it turns out if r equals v that tells us c1 is equal to zero and if r equals negative v that also tells us that c1 is equal to zero and then so that's like the first thing this is the second thing and then the third thing is we get the reference relations so we get two reference relations if r is equal to v we get the reference relation um, we'll call it ck plus 2 equals negative ck lambda square over k plus 2 plus v quantity squared minus v squared equals okay let's simplify that to be negative ck lambda squared over well I may not simplify I just leave it like that so that's if k if r is equal to v we get that reference relation now because there's like a, a two shift Uh, relation between k plus 2 and k and c1 is equal to 0 all the odd coefficients will be 0 so all odd coefficients c1 c3 c5 c7 etc will be 0 so only even coefficients will be left And so we call them C2n. So a lot more work. We'll call them C2n. They turn out to be of the form negative 1 to the n and lambda squared to the n all over 4 to the n times n times n minus 1 times 3 times 2 times 1 times n plus v times n minus 1 plus v dot 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 times 2 plus v times 1 plus v however the first one is a factorial. The first one is just n factorial. However, the second one, v may or may not be an integer. So this is n factorial. But this one, we don't know. v may not be an integer. Positive integer. So it's like a factorial, but it's not quite a factorial. So what we're going to do is we're going to use something called the gamma function. So it's almost like a factorial, but it's not quite there. So we're going to use something called the gamma function. So definition. The gamma function. is defined by gamma of z equals integral from 0 to infinity x to the z minus 1 e to the negative x dx So this gamma function is 
basically a generalization of factorial. So basically generalizes factorial to any real number. Any positive number, I should say any positive number. All right, so um, turns out that gamma, if you do plug in an integer like n plus 1, gamma of n plus 1 is actually just n factorial. So that's an interesting, interesting thing. So the second product actually, so n plus v times n minus 1 plus, yeah, n minus 1 plus v times 2 plus v times 1 plus v. Basically, that second part of the denominator is actually going to be written in terms of gamma functions, gamma of n plus v minus 1 over gamma of v plus 1. It's like we stopped our factorial short, right? It's like we left off the v and the v minus 1, the v minus 2, all the way down 3, 2, 1. So it's like we divided by uh, the rest of the terms. So this is the gamma function, and it actually helps us rewrite that denominator for our coefficients uh, c2n. So then can get back to our discussion of the coefficients c2n can be written in terms of gamma functions. So this is going to be negative 1 to the n gamma of v plus 1 lambda squared to the n all over 4 to the n n factorial gamma of n plus v plus 1 times c0. So, also, if we choose c0 to be of the form lambda to the v over 2 to the v gamma of 1 plus v, then this simplifies our solution. Then y1 of x can be written as a summation n equals 0 to infinity. c2n x to the n, uh, 2n plus v. And after some work, this can be simplified to the summation 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, 1 over n factorial, gamma n plus v plus 1, lambda times x over 2 to the n, 2n plus v. And similar results for r equals negative v. So similar result for r equals negative v. Let me fix my gamma. It's pretty ugly. Okay, now, I know it's a pretty heavy, a lot going on, but hang in there. Um, we're going to take this and turn it into something we call a Bessel function, so a definition. Definition, let v be greater than zero. Then we define the Bessel function. of the first kind
by is defined by the Bessel function of the first kind is defined by uh, j sub v of x equals a summation from 0 to infinity negative 1 to the n 1 over n factorial gamma n plus v plus 1 times x over 2 to the 2n plus v and j sub negative v uh, these are actually Bessel functions, Bessel functions of the first kind. And j sub negative v of x is defined by summation 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, 1 over n factorial gamma n plus v plus 1, whoops, sorry, n minus v plus 1. times x over 2 to the 2n minus v. And both are guaranteed to converge. on the interval 0 to infinity. So theorem, we basically derived this already, but it says for lambda greater than 0 and v greater than 0, such that v is not an integer, the general solution of the Bessel equation x squared y double prime plus x y prime plus lambda squared x squared minus v squared y equals 0 is y of x equal to c1 j sub v of lambda x plus c2 j sub negative v of lambda x. So that is our solution to the Bessel equation. It's uh, pretty heavy, I know, but hang in there. Actually, on the exam, this is all you have to write down, which is amazing, because Bessel functions are already like programmed into most computers, you know, like in Wolfram Alpha, or if you use MATLAB, or if you use any kind of library for any kind of programming language, there's some Bessel function command in there. It does all this calculation for you. Bam. All you got to do is plug in an x value, and you get the uh, Bessel equation solution. All you got to do is figure out what is v, what is lambda, plug those in, you get your, uh, you get your answer. So that's, uh, that's nice. However, this does not work if v is not an integer, or if v is an integer. So question, what if v is an integer? Right, that's a, that's a problem, right? <laughs> Can't just always use uh, non-integers. So what we have to do is create a new definition for something we call the Bessel equation, or sorry, the Bessel function of the second kind. It's a definition. Let's see. For non-integer v, we define y sub v of x to be 
cosine of v pi times j sub v of x minus j sub negative v of x all over sine of v pi. For v equals m, an integer, define y sub m of x to be the limit it to be the limit as v goes to m of y sub v of x. The functions y sub v are called Bessel functions of the second kind. So if we have an integer, we can actually just use this y sub m function, and that'll tell us our solution. So theorem, and this ends our discussion of Bessel. So the theorem says um, for lambda greater than zero and any v greater than zero, the general solution of the Bessel equation x squared y double prime plus xy prime plus lambda squared x squared minus v squared y equals zero is y of x equals c1 j sub v of lambda x plus c2 y sub v of lambda x. And that works in any case. So you can always write this down and get it correct. If you have a non-integer value, you could use j sub negative v if v is a non-integer. But if v is an integer, you can use this. If v is a non-integer, you can use this either way. On the web work or on the homework, you have to be careful. Make sure that you're um, answering the question appropriately. Like it'll tell you what to put in, j or y. But y always works. j only works in general. jv and j negative v only work whenever you have uh, non-integer values of v. But that wraps up our discussion of Bessel, which is... Uh, which is a relief, right? That was getting pretty heavy there. Of course, I, I skipped so many steps. Um, you're welcome to go back and try to fill those in, starting out with the method of Frobenius, working your way all the way, all the way through to try to get the uh, initial roots, r equals plus minus v, and then uh, go through and try to get those uh, even coefficients to be of the form that I had them. And then from there, I think it's pretty straightforward based on our definitions of gamma. So. However, you're not going to have to do anything like this in the exams, so uh, don't fret, don't, uh, don't freak out. This is all pretty intense, but it's not going to be anything like that. There's not going to be anything like this on the exam. The only thing would be, uh, can you find the solution to the Bessel equation? Well, that just means write down C1JV of lambda x plus C2YV of lambda x. Like it's super easy on the exam. You just have to remember where to put the lambda and put the v. So, but just to be thorough, um, if you actually do anything in the real world, Bessel equations really uh, pop up, um, particularly with like vibrating uh, membranes, like a drum head or something like that, or something that vibrates. It's like struck with a, I don't know, wind even. Like uh, wind could make something vibrate. And so like these Bessel equations pop up in those uh, multivariable differential equations or those partial differential equations. 
they reduce down to uh, Bessel equations. So the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, Legendre equations. So the Legendre equation. Oh, sorry. So Legendre equation is of this form. So now Legendre equation. is a differential equation 1 minus x squared y double prime minus 2xy prime plus l times l plus 1 times y equals 0. That's called a Legendre equation with where l is a positive integer. So that is called the Legendre equation. Or sometimes it could be written as 1 minus x squared y double prime minus 2x y prime plus lambda y equals 0. So you're not explicitly told what L is. Like let's say, for example, maybe L, you could say L or lambda was going to be 6, well then you would know immediately that L was equal to 2, because it would be 2 times 3. So you could get L if you know lambda. So sometimes, most of the time, it's just given with a number times Y, and you have to figure out what is the corresponding L value. So <laughs> you solve with a series expansion. Just joking, you don't really do what well, you do, but it turns out um, you don't really have to. So, <laughs> series solution, series solution, question mark, lots of work. Sure, okay, at the end of that, you get something called a Legendre polynomial PL of X, which is a summation from k equals 0 to the floor of L over 2 time. Negative 1 to the k, 2L minus 2k factorial over 2 to the L k factorial L minus k factorial L minus 2k factorial x to the L minus k. Oh, sorry, L minus 2k. And this, uh, this is just the floor function. Just means you round in any decimal down regardless of what decimal it is. Like 9.8 would round down to 9. So that is the solution, but that's nasty. My goodness, that's horrible. So we call these things the uh, Legendre polynomials. Legendre polynomials. But we don't use this formula to calculate them because this is like, this is ridiculous. I don't want to look at this thing any longer than I have to. So what we can use is actually something called Rodriguez formula. So Rodriguez formula. And it tells us how to calculate P sub L of X depending on what L is. So that's one over two to the L, L factorial, L derivative with respect to X of x squared minus 1 to the lth power. So it's actually just a polynomial. 
and we can figure out what uh, these Legendre polynomials are. And I'll just write down like a list of them over here for uh, L equals zero. Just write down a list, L equals zero, P sub L, or P zero of X. We'll call it the zeroth polynomial. P zero of X is just gonna be one. L equals one, the first polynomial is just X. L equals two polynomial is one half times three X squared minus one. And I write down one more. Oops, that should just be L. And then L equals three, P three of X is be the third Legendre polynomial. This is one half times five x cubed minus three x. And you keep going, just using this derivative formula, plugging in different values of L you get different solutions to the Legendre equation. So one solution is a power series, the other one is always a polynomial. So find polynomial solutions of Legendre equation, you just use Rodriguez's formula. So this gives you the polynomial solutions. Polynomial solutions of the Legendre equation. So the other solution will always be a power series, but these will give you the polynomial solutions of the Legendre equation. And I, let's see, I was about to say we'll wrap it up, but yeah, I think we will Let's wrap it up there. Tried to, tried to not overwhelm you in the Bessel section. I know there's a lot going on there. But yeah, we'll just uh, we'll cut out here, and uh, wow, get into Laplace transforms uh, Tuesday, Tuesday after our exam. So my goodness, just uh, just cooking, cooking so quickly. Any questions? I'll hang out here for a minute. See if there are any questions. If not, we'll be done for the day. Um, one thing I want to talk about before you go is how to take an open book, open notes exam. So how do you take an open book, open notes exam? Here's my, my suggestion or my strategy for open book, open notes. When I'm studying for an exam, I definitely don't use my book in my notes, okay? I am trying to remember as much as I possibly can. I want to be as independent of my book and my notes as possible because the questions are already, yeah, the test is Tuesday. The questions are already tough, okay? And if I'm having to look through my book a whole lot, that's slowing me down. So what I need my book for is really to just get me out of a jam, okay? I have, I have to say, okay, I got this, uh, I got this variation of parameters and I can't remember where the G goes in my determinant. So I just look it up really fast. Well, that means I have to be familiar with my textbook and, I, and my notes or whatever and know where to look that up. So it's really to just to get me out of a jam. It's not really to, it's not really there for me to use on every single problem. Like I should not be using this on every problem. I should really just use it for those really nitpicky details that I don't quite remember exactly. So if you're looking through your book for every single problem, it's it's gonna be a it's gonna be tough. Like don't rely on it as like, okay, I got my book, I got my notes, I don't have to worry about studying. It's 
I really need to study and my book and my notes are really just to get me out of a jam, really just to get me out of uh, you know, a tough spot. So that's the way I view open book, open notes, and that's the way tests are usually written. Um, they're usually harder. Uh, the time crunch is a lot harder. So it's really just to get you, um, you know, when you forget something. It's not to really help you solve the problems from start to finish. If you're looking up every problem in the book or if you're, you're, you're having to use your book on every problem of the exam, that's, that's an issue. So definitely don't be doing that um, on the exam. That's, that's not what we recommend. So even though it's open book, open notes, and you're free to do that, that's not really the intent. So you should basically not have any trouble with any formulas or anything like that. Now the work, that's all on you. I, you're not going to be able to copy anything out of the book. You're not going to have time to do that. So uh, just just take your time, work the problems, but don't rely on your book to do it. Only rely on your book to get you out of a tight spot. So it's basically you should study as just as if it were an in-class exam where it was closed book, closed notes. And now all you got to do is say, oh, well, if I need it, if I need one little one little detail, I can pull it out. So that's my suggestion. That's the way we view it when we're writing the exam. So we always put like a, a time crunch in there just to keep you honest. And then um, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to be good, but then you also have those you also have the ability to look up a, a little detail if you forget. So it kind of balances out. So any questions? Yeah, our test, test two is, is Tuesday. Like I said, the uh, repeat problem is going to be the mixture problem. So, mixture problem from chapter three. Linear first order equation, mixture problem. All right, intense day. Thanks for, thanks for being here today at class time. I'll see you guys on Tuesday. I'll uh, try to keep you updated over the weekend about exam material and stuff like that if anything changes, but it'll just be pretty similar to how we did the first exam. So, so wait, have a good uh, have a good weekend. I'll talk to you guys later.